So we have um, Josh Gold over on our my far right. Josh has a bachelor's degree from BU and a master's of math education from Lesley University. He currently teaches middle school math at Hanscom Middle School, part of Lincoln Public Schools. And he's spent the last five years creating a flipped classroom as well as creating a programming club and makerspace for fourth through eighth graders. Um, welcome. Thank so you. Ha happy to have you here, Josh. Um, he also just told me that he has been part of a Brookline Interactive Group program, formerly BATV, um, here called Lifestyle by Designs, which his mom is the host of, and yes. you helped found the show. Yes. And Very fact, cool. And the artwork along the wall over there, uh, Otter Awesome, is, I'm the co-author of the, of the book with uh, my wife, my mom, and the artist <laughs> illustrator. So. So check out Josh's art um, on Not your my way art, out. <laughs> your illus you did the illustration. No, the, uh, the illustrator the illustration from the book. The illustration from the book. Very cool. Um, and then we have Jeremy Whalen. Welcome, Jeremy. Jeremy um, is at Northampton High School. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Western Mass. Absolutely, this my pleasure. Um, he's a digital media slash education tech. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then also Elle Williams, Executive Director from Northampton Community Television. Um, and they're going to talk about a Minecraft project in Western Mass using games in the community as a vehicle to teach high school students community build building in real life, democracy online, 3D printing, media literacy, architecture and design, as well as connecting students with media projects within the greater, broader media community. So welcome to all of our panelists. And we're going to go ahead and start with Josh. Thank you. So. Um... I've, I've been fortunate to have uh, the support of the Lincoln School Foundation. It seems similar to the, uh, the Brookline grant opportunities. And um, one of the first things that happened to me when I started teaching in Lincoln on Hanscom six years ago now was my students just didn't seem very engaged. And um, sixth grade math was something they've pretty much been doing in all of elementary school, and we're trying to, as it's been said at some of the PDs I've been to, zip it up, just wrap it all up. And so one thing was, you know, I'm thinking I'm doing sixth grade math every day in my own projects that I'm doing at home, um, hmm. programming and, and stuff like that. So um, I started doing the flipped classroom, as you said, just as a, an outlet to engage students at home. And what happened was I had more time in class. Uh, I wasn't teaching a lesson in class anymore. The students were coming with notes from a lesson they had previously done. And, and before you go on with that, yeah. can you describe, because some folks in the audience or some people um, at home may not understand what a flipped classroom is. Could you maybe describe sure. what that is and how that actually manifested in your classroom from day to day? Sure. And so originally, the flipped classroom's idea was uh, mainly for high school. I missed class. I'm behind. What do I do? So teach. Uh, I, I'm not going to misquote his name. He started by making a video lesson of his class so that those students could catch up. Um, and then everyone's taken it and done whatever they want with it at this point. Uh, essentially, you could think of the creative video lesson. You could think Khan Academy. Um, and students watch a video, and then they come do the homework at home. That was the end uh, class. Sorry, they, that's the flipped part. How, how it happened for me was... Um, my students didn't always do their homework um, for one reason or another. And so I wanted to give them something to do at home that they didn't need help, uh, that was meaningful. And uh, a video of me, they, they, they found that funny. They found it interesting. I, I wear my <laughs> different ties in there. That's how I kind of check if you watch it. Can you show it. your tie that you're wearing? Just it's one of the, cat and mouse. <laughs> one of the quick checks, did you watch the video? Uh, what did I wear? You know, what tie they wear? Um, <laughs> <laughs> students come and tell me, I think you recorded that one in your truck. Um, and so that interesting conversation starters. And uh, through the use of technology, I'm able to actually assess whether they watched it or not, if they got it or not, and uh, adjust what we do in class that day. Hmm. And what I found was that with all the time I had, I was doing more kill and drill, I guess, than I ever thought I would do, where we were just practicing, 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 word problems, word problems, word problems. And so I heard about 3D printing um, uh, three years ago, I think, two or three years ago, and thought that we should get one of these. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the first one was grant through Donors Choose, a competition from uh, code.org. If you get this many hours of uh, coding done by now, by this certain time, we'll give you $500 on, uh, on Donors Choose. And uh, we got a printer. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's, not, it's definitely not the technology that should drive the teaching, but it was a tool that we had that I felt like, well, now I have to figure out how to use it, and I should for the students. And so that's where these projects have come from, the, the, some 3D printing in math class. And um, if you don't know what 3D printing is, if you don't know what 3D printing is, I can show a real quick uh, video in a moment. And just the reason I really love it is because it is engaging. Compelling is this thing that, that is it's part of STEM or STEAM or DREAM, whatever acronym you do. But the math is generally it seems to be left out, or it's, it's, a, it's a footnote, or it's assumed that we understand that all this works because of the math. But a sixth grade student, they're not, they go to sixth grade science, and they don't. They don't get it. They, they don't make the connection that, that you need to use the math that you already know. This isn't new. And it's very frustrating as a math teacher. Um, it's not the student's fault. It's not necessarily my fault. It's, uh, we're in a new age now where we have to literally, we shouldn't have maybe science or math class. We should have just education. Uh, you know. um, and so the tangible part of these 3D projects, they, they take them home and they could talk to their parents. And the students have talked uh, about math at home. And I think that's. I had to say, how do you grade how this is working out? It's, it, the students just talked about math at the dinner table on their own. That, it's exciting. Uh, and so I think 3D printing is awesome. And I think, think everyone else should, too, if, if you don't. Um, and we also were speaking about students connecting to real life. Uh, I don't know if anyone's read the 36-page document from NASA about uh, colonizing Mars. In there, they lay out, in 10 years, there will be jobs for 3D printing structures on Mars to live. Uh, and there's companies currently vying for those contracts. Um, yeah, I read The Martian to students uh, a little bit this year, blanked out a bit. And um, we did math around The Martian because it was more compelling. Um, it takes a lot of time, but the kids appreciate it and, and they, they understand it. So that's why another reason why 3D printing is important. It's, it's not easy to do, which is why I continue to do it in class. You need to problem solve with scale factors all the time, which is sixth grade math, fraction decimal operations. So if you don't know what 3D printing is, uh, this is the first print job I ever did. I think it, uh, I think it took eight hours to print. I was going to throw the machine away. And uh, you'll see in a moment that uh, it just it, it does, it's working on an XY just like a printer, and then it adds the Z level. Uh, up and down, and this is just a, a case for an Arduino uh, microcontroller that we had in our classroom that, uh, that students were able to use. We didn't design this. We went online, found it, printed it, and, and students three years ago were very excited to uh, start 3D printing, and, and we all found out that it's a lot harder than, than, we, than, than we thought it would be. And um, let's see, it should be. So here's just a couple of examples of, of sixth grade math and seventh grade math being used in. Um, in the classroom, you have a maze. Some student wanted to, wanted to create a maze. And I said, sure, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Because at the time, at least, I felt like I had to know a little bit more than them. <laughs> but I also felt like if, if, if someone came in and asked, like, this is great, but what math are you doing? I felt like I wanted to be able to say that we're doing math. And I knew it was in there. And you know, this, this is actually, I don't have the, expression, the, the uh, inequality up here to show, because uh, it's just an example here, but this is actually following the uh, inequality. I believe they solve uh, 20 is greater than or equal to 4x my, uh, plus 2, something like that. And those are in millimeters. And so our print bed is 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Uh, we measured the ball bearing that we stole from my children at home for the maze. And um, it, it took them a while to really understand, which is great, that we had to have that constant of plus 2. Because if you repeated your, your 4x, which was the thickness of the wall and the thickness of your, um, of your path, then you always ended up with double walls or an extra wall or missing a wall. So we had to have that constant where we actually started at, on one side with the wall. And um, we talked about algebraic expressions uh, to do this. And that's a real key concept that we, we are doing in sixth grade. Uh, the blue one's a, a Greek temple. They do ancient civilizations in uh, seventh grade architecture. If you, if you want to do 3D printing, think about architecture. And these guys will talk maybe a little more about, sort of. <laughs> uh, but uh, architecture is amazing. There's math everywhere in there, and kids love it. So uh, we were doing scale factors in seventh grade and said, hey, you're studying Greek, ancient Greek uh, civilization. So 
go research the Parthenon or, or whatever you want, and if you need some help, I'm here. Uh, so in order to print this, they had to have done it right, I guess. I'm not going to print a blob or a uh, something to put on, on my wall that doesn't actually look like the Parthenon, because that would be silly. And so they get motivated to know when they've done it right. Um, the bottom left one's a factor lattice. And I just wanted students to do two things. When am I done factoring a number? No one could tell me that. And it's not their fault. It's not their teacher's fault. Uh, it's no one's fault. When am I done factoring a number? How do I know that? And my question was, how do I get kids to go home and talk about factoring numbers? Um, and so this is just a factor lattice that uses prime factorization. We have the common core standards that I do teach. And it says students should be able to prime factor and use it, period. Cool, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what should I do with it? And so I can, you can simplify fractions with that. But good luck convincing a student who already knows the answer to most of these to use that so that when they get to the problem that's really hard, know to use that. Um, so this uses prime factorization. You prime factor the number 30, and you get, let's see if I can do it, 2 times 3 times 5. And all of those are, uh, are 2 to the, the 1, 3 to the 1, and 5 to the 1. And they all come out of 1, which is any number to the 0. And you then fill in the lattice. And 2 times 5 is 10. And, and it turns out that 6 times 5 is, is, is 30. And those are all of the factors of 30. You can use this. We can go further, and the, the, the math is college-level math to understand why it's working and, and all that. But you can apply this to least common multiples as well. Combine two lattices and fill everything in, and you find their least common multiple. So it's, it's, it's very cool. And then gears, it's a very terrible project, but it actually uses an uh, example of the project. It uses circles, ratios of diameters, uh, to create a, a gear ratio of, of, I think this one's 10 to 20 maybe, and why you know one turns 10 times, one turns 20 times, two to one ratio. And at MassQ on Thursday, I, I, I was able to speak to some people about integrating uh, ratios of forces into this project, which is something we do in um, science class and make it a little more for the students to come up with something new on their own. Um, yeah. So those are just some examples of some of the projects that are using sixth grade math, seventh grade math, and are engaging students in thinking about using the math. Uh, and so another project we do is uh, the Tangram project. Give them the picture and ask them to put it on a grid. Uh, I think it's a 40 by 40 grid, which is the least common multiple of all of the denominators, which I tell them. Most of them glaze over. But you know, telling them, to design this project, I used your math that we just did, or that you should know already. And, um, and then throw a, a, a wrench in there and say, sorry, I only want this to be an 8 centimeter puzzle when we're done. And, uh, the iPad app they use requires them to multiply anything to scale it. So they have to multiply by decimals to scale it. And what, how do I do that? <laughs> what should I multiply? And um, it's fun. We get, we get a, a, a dry erase marker, go to the board, and start trying stuff. And um, hopefully they can find the pattern to figure out how to, how to make this process easier on the next scale factor that I need. And um, hmm. I don't have a Tangram project with me, but this is actually the factor lattice printed out right here. And uh, it failed a little bit because the design didn't actually <laughs> stick here. <laughs> but uh, that's fine. It's awesome. And the students, uh, the reason I don't have any Tangram projects is because they all took those home, which is awesome as well. Uh, this is the most successful project we've had so far and uh, the most that have been completed. Kids are coming during school, after school, lunchtime to, to finish it. Uh, that's kind of the carrot part design it, print it. And that's how I've gotten kids to my makerspace, our makerspace during launch is to finish these projects. Uh, so here's that project actually being printed from the top, I believe. There we go. And so how we actually design these pieces is they have a cube. It's like a Play-Doh cube, um, two centimeters by two centimeters. And they have to actually mash it using scaling factors to the shape that they want. That parallelogram they would tell you was the single hardest thing they've probably ever done in math. Just because the, the, the base and height that they have, the base is not the actual base of the rectangle that they need to create. Um, and so this year, this is all a process. All of this stuff that we've been talking about today is incredible. Set your goal for 10 years from now, maybe. Uh, write the first grant. Um, sorry? Go to Mars. Yeah, go to Mars. Well, you know, 
I, I'm a teacher because I, I it, 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 sorry, I'm part part of the reason I'm a teacher is because what I really wanted to do didn't happen for me, which is fine. And now I'm here to try and help some other students realize those things as well. And um, and in middle school, you know, it's not the ten years from now a sixth grader is what in college, right? So that job is is there when they're in college, a couple years away from graduating, and. Hopefully, some of them are preparing right now. I have six kids who read or are listening to The Martian after parental uh, approval. And um, awesome. Uh. So, uh, so just quick, this is, this is the project we're doing right now in class. And uh, we're, we're supposed to be studying algebraic expressions and, and all that kind of stuff. And I stole this from actually a Canadian education agency as well. I, uh, and the idea of, of space stations, modular space stations. We moved into modular buildings last year. So that connection was great. The students this year don't really understand the, the, the emphasis on modular uh, classrooms because it's something they already know uh, from last year. So we kind of switched this up. And now we're, the background of the project is more uh, the Hermes spaceship station that, that went to Mars from the Martian. Uh, just continuing with that. and we're. We're going to have a competition who's, who can defend one of these the best or create their own and defend it the best for the, the style of space station. And the idea is like, you know, guys and girls, it's not that it's necessarily the functional space station. It's the idea of the modular, each mission. We have a new phase. How can we predict um, the hundredth phase? Because we're never going to stop going to Mars, right? Um, how many modules we will have? How much will that cost? And so through that, they, they, they're working on their patterns and um, just spatial understanding of these different rules and able to explain why I'm drawing this one, why what I drew may not, might not be correct. Um, and then some of these students actually thought of, well, here's the pattern, Mr. Gold. Like, why do you keep asking me? Um, and so they decided to <laughs> use art so that I'd stop talking to them. And that's great. Um, so this student just he was able to write his first algebraic expressions without me. Uh, he'd never really used a variable before. And down here, you can actually see that um, he's using pattern power, as I like to say, uh, to write a, an algebraic expression, write out uh, an explanation of, um, of how the phases are developed and stuff like that. And so the end result for one of these, and I'm not sure what the next slide is exactly. OK. So to. This is a space station, and so when they go home, they can they can say, "Well, mom, this is you know we always have this part, the principal's office, a couple of engines in our cafeteria. This is when we did it last year. We haven't I don't know what the terms are going to be this year yet. Talking about uh, Martian and space stations, and each phase we're we're adding eight classrooms, and hopefully they say this is our rate of of growth or or something that we've spoken about. And then you know after two phases we have uh, 20 modules, and so this is the algebraic expression 8x plus four. And so, um, yeah, it, it's very cool. Um, and kids seem to think so, too. And it's very hard, which is, I think, important as well. And uh, we throw in, I throw in a couple of do nows and, and kill and drill problems and open responses. And um, this year, they'll be writing their actual report and maybe even making a, uh, you know, a, a little brief explanation, video explanation of what they're doing and share that with the faculty and, and students and have them vote on which one they think should be the space station that goes to Mars. Uh, so thank you. Great. Thank you, Josh. Cool. OK. Let's take a look. Is that it? Oh, my bad. OK. So the Northampton Minecraft project is, uh, is a collaborative effort between Northampton Community Television and uh, Northampton High School Technology Department. The way that this project got started, um, my co-teacher was, was absent one day, and he has a room right next to me. And as I was walking down the hallway to go to uh, the office, I peeked my head in, and I saw a TV with uh, how it's made, a VHS that the um, the, my co-teacher just recently had a child, and he, he didn't have a lesson plan and, uh, for that day. Uh, so on an old VHS uh, TV, there was how it's made on in the corner. The lights are off. But then I see, coming from the projector in the middle of the room, a VGA cord coming all the way down into a laptop. 
and a student playing Minecraft with all the other students watching. And I said, wow, what is going on here? Everybody, instead of being, uh, you know, there's clearly no uh, you know, in interest in this movie. Everybody is watching this one student and, and on, on this Minecraft world. And I said, what's going on here? So this was the, uh, and this started a year and a half long relationship with uh, one of a terrific student that I have, Zev Seltzer. He's the project lead on this uh, project. He's unable to be here today because of relig religious uh, observances. But I said, you're coming anyways. We made a short little video, and he's <laughs> going to do a little technical aspect of showing this. But what that really shows is we really start to, we really have to change the way, we really need to flip the script of what, is intrinsically interesting to students and how they learn. Uh, so just really briefly, two minute overview of the project. The Northampton Minecraft Project is actually a collaborative not only with NCTV, but also with the Northampton Planning Office. Uh, it takes North, uh, the Minecraft world and it incorporates, and you can go to the next slide, it incorporates li LiDAR data. And LiDAR data is, there's a plane overhead and it, it sends signals and bounces them back to give you topographical data of, uh, in, in this case, the city of Northampton. Um, Zev was so giddy about this, uh, about this new, we, we had some coarse uh, topographical maps, but Zev was so giddy that we got this LiDAR data. He was there waiting with a, with a hard drive. The day that it came out, before the, the, the actual people who paid tens of thousands of dollars of this data to, to get actually had it. So he was the first one to actually parse through this data. Um, and that just shows the motivation uh, and the intrinsic value of when you're interested in something, when you're motivated, you can, you really, it, it, it plays into that educational uh, the components of, of, of learning. And so uh, the next slide is, is where that data comes in in the first rendition of uh, our city. So this is the first rendition. Again, you can see that it's, it's really coarse. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and it's all the same types of blocks. But after, uh, after kind of management of some students and, and painting the world, you can go to the next slide, we have our actual city. And this, is, uh, this has been a, a tremendous effort, not only on Zev's part, but also the management of other students, which I'll get into in a second. And so, like I said, uh, we, when, I, when we learned that Zev couldn't be here today, I said, you're coming anyways. We're going to make this nice video. And so we have a, uh, a video. The Northampton Minecraft Project is a collaborative effort from, between the Northampton High School Technology Department and the Northampton Community Television and Northampton City Planning Office to recreate the city of Northampton in the game of Minecraft using LiDAR data, which let us take a 3D model of the entire city and just convert that directly into the game of Minecraft. When the map is finished, I really hope to be able to use it for educational lessons based in the 3D city. And also, I hope to be able to use it for virtual exploration of the city so you, people can walk around, um, maybe learn about different buildings as they see them, and possibly even actually feel like they're walking in the city by using Oculus Rift headset, um, head mounted displays. And so the things that I really want to, um, to hit on here, uh, it's a little hard to see here, but the main thing that I've learned in, uh, over the course of uh, this project and also other capstone projects and independent projects with my students, we really need to be looking at the teacher in, in really different ways. I always say that teachers are now CEOs. And that usually has a negative connotation because we think about monetary efficiency. But if you ever look at my pay stub, I'm the poorest CEO you're going to ever see. But I, we're also, teachers are the most important CEOs as well because I, we are the managers of the educational efficiency and the learning of all of our students. And you cannot put a price on that. And so 
what you really have to do, there's, there's something really flawed with a system that will penalize a student for being 30 minutes late after a bell, but disregard three hours of learning after school on an independent project. And so the things that we look for, the, the things that really make our society great are these, this idea of, of innovation and, uh, and the, the risk taking that, that uh, goes along with the experiential knowledge that uh, one can have in the learning process. Uh, and so when a student comes, comes to me with a project like this or when a student comes uh, and uh, I will talk about this, it's looking at this as almost a startup. Some of the people that we look up to most in our society, the Gateses of, the soci of our society, the Steve Jobses of our society, they, they were focusing on, they were, they were learning in a non-traditional setting. And so what happens is, why, why, do we, why do we perpetuate these standardized testings? And why do we perpetuate this common core when the, the people that we really are, are looking to or the, the things that really influence our society are not the same structures? Uh, and so uh, that also, just like echoing what everybody said here, uh, it's not only the focus on technical skills, but the soft skills. And one of the other biggest things that I've learned is it's okay for your students to know that you're not, that you do not have all the answers to things. And that plays into this, that CEO part again in the sense that you, I, starting this project, I knew nothing about Minecraft. I knew nothing about GIS data. But I knew about project management. I knew about how to guide students and, get, and connect them with the resources like NCTV and the Northampton Planning Office. And, I, and, and set deadlines and expectations and guide them through that process. So it's really, it puts a teacher in a vulnerable, vulnerable position to say, I don't know this piece of software. Uh, there's certain things that I, you know, I have an expertise in, but it's impossible to learn all of these tools. But it's not impossible to guide students in the direction that, will, that they're interested in. Uh, and then ultimately what happens is after they gain those technical, uh, that technical aspects, they move on to that level that you're in. So that management of others. And that's where kind of the project is, is at a crossroads right now, where Zev is actually assembling a team to manage them and watch them grow. He has all that technical expertise. Now it's time to graduate into that management and, and learn some of those and learn some of those skills. Uh, these two pictures, just um, to show you, uh, a couple days a uh, couple days ago, there was a school local Northampton rally in which this, the the superintendent, the mayor, and the president of MTA spoke. They set up their computers and they uh, showed elementary and middle schoolers the project, and side by side they guided they guided these students. It was amazing. Here. Again, it's not about just the technical, it's about those soft skills. This is Zev, who probably never imagined himself being put into this position, but speaking in front of 500 uh, fellow students at Northampton High School uh, on the Minecraft project. So again, it's developing not only that technical skill in that certain specific software, but also looking at the larger picture. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Al Williams. Um, so. My name is Al Williams. I'm the director of Northampton Community Television, which is the equivalent of BIG in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is in Western Massachusetts. Um, our partnership in this project, um, as Kathy's mentioned about BIG, we don't really think about ourselves as a television station, even though TV is still in our name for the time being. Um, we really think of ourselves as an organization that empowers um, expression of any sort, and we don't make any assumptions about what that means, which can seem very, very broad, um, but we, it's a starting point for us. And, and our, our partnership in this project was that we are an incubator, and as Jeremy might be the CEO, we are the venture capitalists of the project. Okay, so um, what, what that allows us to do is seek out community partners and invest in them, um, in, invest in them financially. Um, and these are usually small financial investments. I think in the Minecraft project it cost us about $500 plus $20 a month is our investment into it. Um, but it allows us to create circumstances and find community projects in which um, we can take risks and which people who have interest in, in taking risks are empowered to do so. And in large structures like school districts and municipalities, it can be very challenging to take risks. And so we can be a good partner in, in creating spaces for that risk taking to occur and providing resources for that to occur. Um, 
I think that one of the appeals, my sort of connection, and, and I, this concept came to me because we had been at a community media conference and discovered that there was a group in Lake Compounds um, just outside of Burlington that was recreating Lake Compounds on a one-to-one -one scale. Lake Compounds, Lake Champlain, not Lake Compounds, <laughs> I'm sorry, Lake Champlain. And, um, and doing it through a, an educational program through a, um, a marine biological organization. Okay, this wasn't a traditional school district. Um, so when we started conceiving that project, we sort of had already had this idea that we wanted to do something with Minecraft. And the reason we thought Minecraft was a great um, tool was because there's a lot of interest in it. And um, we are always trying to get rid of our own assumptions about the ways that people want to express themselves and communicate. And that can be a very challenging thing to do. Um, it's something we try to practice on a daily basis. Um, one thing Tessa said about power, when she talked about power in her, her discussion that one aspect of media, there's always a result of, um, there's an aspect of power making when you are, when you are creating media. And um, one way that, that we like to think about that is one of those kinds of power can be self-power. And when you're engaged in storytelling, what you're teaching people to do when they are beginning to learn storytelling is you're, tr creating, you're teaching them to create identity. And that creation of identity is its self-power. And I'm almost hesitant to say call that empowerment, because empowerment often culturally means towards something or against something. I just mean identity. And um, so uh, <laughs> and I can tend to sort of wander a little bit in my thinking here. But what I'm, what I'm really trying to get at is that's one way we don't make assumptions about the kinds of ways in which we teach people to communicate. People are interested in communicating using a certain tool. We want to invest in that communication, because we don't know what kind of identities people are going to create in the future. And by not assuming that we know those things, um, it allows us to be surprised, and it allows us to advance uh, in ways that are unexpected and get around our own hang-ups that are our own assumptions. So um, that's sort of where we are in the investment strategy. There's also a larger community aspect of this for us in that we like, you know, for, for our students, we're currently, this is a long-term project, building the entire city. What Jeremy showed you today, that's, that's, it's very, it's a really, well-rendered part of the city, but it is a very small part of the city that we're finished with, okay? <laughs> Most of it is still that gray area. Um, however, it gives us an opportunity to get the community invested in, and also we'd like to open this up in the future to be a community project, which bridges between the school system and the community, okay? Where we could have, um, I guess it'd be community service learning almost, right? Where you have um, people in a senior center who are maybe building the senior center in Minecraft. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what that will look like. But um, the idea is to inspire people into community conversation um, about things like planning. Um, this, kind of, this kind of project, you can, you can utilize it practically in moving buildings around a city, potentially, or teaching about the history of the city, or just inspiring people to um, feel some pride or involvement with their city, which are all good results for us. So. And building on that, too, one of the things that I'm, I'm a big proponent of uh, and that NCTV has been wonderful and tremendous with is designing curriculum that is not trapped in the vacuum of the school. So we'll do, this is one of many projects that we collaborate on. One, another one, for instance, the seven-day film sprint in which students have seven days to make a film, and then we have a community showing of these. And so when you, when there is that community response and feedback, that will add to the motivation of students. It's not just, it not just goes onto a computer and then I tuck it away on a little DVD that goes into my desk. It's stuff that's out and about. It's, we, put on, we put them on YouTube. We put them into festivals and contests, and, the, and we have discussions uh, about this. And it not only builds uh, the educational components of the students, but also it builds in the, in the larger aspects of how we, how we uh, open that dialogue for our own communities. And I think that's a, a great um, parallel to what we're doing here at Brookline Interactive Group, because we have Chrissy Frazier, um, who is also teaching at the high school. So she has dual roles, really. And um, that's not unlike your situation, yeah. where Jeremy actually was once an employee of NCTV and now is a teacher and is 
going after his master's in education. And it's really exciting to see sort of him take that experience in community media and sort of bring it to education and be able to apply some of these things that I think because we are outside of the school district in community media, we have some flexibility and freedom to do things. He's sort of bringing that into the education realm as well. And so I, I'm excited to see sort of what he does with it, what Josh continues to do with it. It's really exciting to hear what, what you're both doing and um, tying in with the community media aspect. Um, you know, how we can be an incubator of projects like this, how we can bring these projects to schools, how we can help support you in ways that you may not be able to do something specifically in your school, but we can provide some of the support or equipment or expertise. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration. So um, quick questions from the audience. Or evidence that kids will stick with something if there's something there for them. Um, so that's the credit to you both. I think that's really a cool thing. And I think building on that as well, the I, uh, we offer elective courses uh, at the, the I, would, I do intro to videography, intro to photography, 3D modeling. Um, these courses are tradition. I, uh, the, the students that come into my classes are not traditionally the students that are thinking of themselves as excelling in school. And these students are not the ones that are taking the, they're filling all of their courses with AP classes and, uh, and taking, uh, we, our school offers Smith courses. So these students are coming into my class thinking that they're going, that they're already uh, under a certain portion of our society. And that is, and that's really what we're trying to change and, and destroy that, that, uh, that ideology that's kind of embedded in our systems. The, it's, it's through hard work, through that, that doing experiential learning uh, over and over, trial and error, honing in on your skills. It's that hard work that really will, will make the difference and it's not necessarily that, that intelligence of the traditional aspects. I think that's a really great point, which ties in really well to some of the things that uh, Jennifer Fisher Mueller was talking about, our deputy superintendent of schools here, how to make um, the experience that I described be the norm. That, um, that there isn't a difference between differentiated, differentiated learning styles, that we are able to uh, teach in a way that really captivates everyone, engages all students in that process. And also builds, I think your point, to really build confidence is, confidence is really important. Definitely. Um, and not just um, the not just covering those learning outcomes, but also building um, them as individuals to think, wow, you know, I can I can do things that I didn't know I could do, and tapping into their potential. Yeah. How do you incorporate humanities and art into uh, these projects? So it's not just a sort of oh, and by the way, here's how you deal with people sort of thing, but it's like really integrated into the whole system. Do you want to answer some of um, One of the tools in, in Makerspace is uh, it's called a Hummingbird Kit. And uh, it's, it's uh, scratch programming with uh, uh, electronic modules that just plug and, plug and play. And a lot of the projects are, are s art students come in. And they, they, I think we had a robot chicken that laid an egg at, at, a, at a science fair last year and a uh, WALL-E. And I think someone's making an R2-D2 this year. So it's, it's not necessarily humanities, but it, it's, it's art that they're adding in that technical piece to it when it, when it comes to the technology aspect. Um, the, that, that same company's website has examples of, um, I think, a Shakespeare play that students use this to uh, create a scene from the play and had certain things moving around and, and just another way to express what they're doing in other classes. Uh, so I know we have more questions. Unfortunately, we have to wrap because we are running a little bit behind. So I want to encourage you to come up and ask our panelists questions throughout the rest of the afternoon. Um, we are going right to lunch. So we want to make sure that you guys have um, time for lunch. So I'm sure that they can be available to you during lunch. And um, please join me in thanking them for coming and presenting their work. Thank you.